Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you guys today is a case that involves the murder of a young woman that is absolutely just so senseless and the hunt for her killer turned into an international one and what resulted after that is definitely pretty interesting. But before we get into it, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Ritual. Ritual is a well-researched multivitamin that is on a mission to reimagine health and take the guesswork out of vitamins. Ritual's multivitamin contains high-quality nutrients such as D3 and omega-3, which are nutrients that are very difficult to intake throughout the day, even if you have a very healthy diet. I know that I struggle on a daily basis to get these nutrients in, even though I try every single day to make sure I'm eating as healthy as possible. Ritual's vitamins are vegan-friendly, GMO-free, gluten-free, allergen-free, and they have no added sugars. Transparency is at the core of everything that Ritual does. They want you to know everything from where their nutrients are sourced to the environmental impact of the materials used to ship thousands of orders. I currently take the women's multivitamin, but they also offer a men's multivitamin, 50 plus prenatal, postnatal, kids, and teen vitamins. They have also just recently launched their essential protein range, so they pretty much much have something for everybody. I really like that Ritual's vitamins are gentle on an empty stomach with their delayed release capsule designs. I often take a couple of hours in the morning to get an appetite enough to eat breakfast or sometimes I just forget to eat breakfast for a little bit because I'm not hungry. So it's really important to me to have a vitamin that won't cause a nasty stomach ache. They also keep a mint tab in every bottle to make sure that your vitamins are always smelling minty fresh. Now, better health does not happen overnight, so make sure you head to Ritual right now because they're offering my subscribers 20% off of your first order. Fill in the gaps of your everyday diet with your essentials for women or men to support a healthy foundation for your body. That's ritual.com slash rs20 and use code rs20 at checkout to get 20% off of your first month. Thank you again so much to Ritual for sponsoring today's video. With all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the murder of Haley Anderson. Haley Anderson was born May 9th, 1995 in Westbury, Long Island, New York to her parents, Karen and Gordon Anderson. She had one younger sister named Maddie. At the time of her death, she had been a fifth-year senior at Binghamton University where she was going to school for a degree in nursing. She had worked at a coffee shop on campus called Jasmine's as a barista in the Glenn D. Bartle Library. She had worked there for the past five years and she was set to graduate in May of 2018. She already had a job lined up for her after she was set to graduate at an emergency room in Long Island. One of Haley's best friends, Josie, described Haley as being the warmest person that you could be around. She said that she didn't know anybody who didn't like Haley. She had a contagious laugh, and Josie said that she was always laughing because Haley was always laughing. She was a lively, extroverted girl with so many interests and passions. She loved music, and she would often sit with her friends and listen to their other friend, John, play the guitar. One of her other best friends, Brittany, said, quote, She was beautiful inside and out, a beautiful girl. She had this radiant personality, and you could throw her in a room with strangers, and they'd all be best friends within five minutes because that's just how she was. She made everything fun. She was silly and goofy and jumped around and had dance parties, but she was also a hard worker. She would study for tests for days and she would do well on them. Haley was described by her mother as a millennial hippie. She was a free spirit who trusted everyone and was kind to everyone. When she started at Binghamton University, she had to work hard to be accepted into their nursing program, but she was accepted. It meant that she would have to be there for an extra year of school, but she didn't mind. She was really excited for her career. All Haley wanted to do was help people, which was evident by her career choice. She was an amazing student and got straight A's, and she was looking forward to her future career as a nurse. Now, while attending Binghamton University, Haley met another young man named Kevin. Kevin was also a nursing student, and the two headed off very quickly, and they quickly began a relationship. However, 
However, it seemed that Haley was more interested in having a casual relationship. According to Kevin, she just wanted to live freely before committing to a long-term serious relationship. She had always had dreams of moving to California and getting a hippie van and just being out on the road and working as a travel nurse. At the time, Haley was also living with her two close friends, Josie and Mishila, in an off-campus apartment. Now, in 2016, Kevin had thrown a party at his off-campus apartment, and of course, Haley attended the party. And this is where she met another young man named Orlando Tessero. He was also a nursing student born in Miami, Florida, but he grew up in Nicaragua. Orlando's family was relatively well off with his father being a physician, so it made sense that Orlando would follow in his footsteps into the medical field. Now, Haley had known Orlando previously because they did have a couple of classes together, but they never really grew an actual friendship until they chatted at Kevin's party. Orlando was the type of guy who worked really hard during the week, and then he would relax, have some fun, have some drinks, and party on the weekends, and that's pretty much exactly exactly how Haley lived her life. They were both very social. They loved being with their friends and making new friends, and they both were very good at making new friends, and they were always the life of the party, so the two got along very well. After they became friends, both Haley and Kevin would all hang out together with Orlando. At the same time, Kevin was in a fraternity and he was trying to recruit people to join, and he did ask Orlando to join his frat. Kevin also seemed to have a lot in common with Orlando. They were both Hispanic and they were the only two people in the fraternity that could speak Spanish, so it just seemed like it made sense that the two of them would be friends. However, as I stated before, Haley and Kevin did have a bit of an on-again, off-again type of relationship. So, during one of their breaks, Haley and Orlando hooked up a couple of times. But from the very beginning, those around Haley said that she made it very, very clear to Orlando that she didn't want a serious relationship. She just wanted the type of thing where it would be casual and that they could hook up, they would still be friends and talk all the time, but that was it. It was not a serious, exclusive relationship. According to Orlando's then roommate and best friend, Jesse, the two were known to hang out all the time and they started to seem to develop their own on-again, off-again type of relationship. Sometimes they would bicker and argue. Sometimes Haley would be over all the time and they could be heard laughing hysterically for hours on end and having an amazing time. Then there were other times that they didn't even see each other at all for extended periods of time. But throughout all of this, they always seemed to have that understanding that they had this friendship together, that they had a very casual sort of, you know, relationship when they would hook up, but that was about it. It got to a point though that the other guys in the frat had found out about the relationship between Orlando and Haley, and they would try to talk Orlando out of hooking up with her because because of Kevin and because of how it would look to Kevin since obviously the two of them were friends, the two of them were both friends with Haley and Kevin had already been known to date Haley before. Then eventually Haley did tell Orlando that she no longer wanted any sort of romantic relationship with him. She said that they could be friends but that she wanted to completely cut off any sort of romantic connection with him. After this, of course, Orlando just did not want to let Haley go or take no for an answer. He started coming around to their house all the time, completely uninvited. According to Josie, Haley's roommate, he would sometimes just come over to their apartment and would just sit on their porch and smoke a cigarette. They also started to notice that Orlando would just drive by their place all of the time and just sort of look into their apartment. At this time, Josie, who again is Haley's roommate, said that they would just always find him creeping around and she was usually the one who had to go and deal with him. Because Haley and Orlando had been such close friends, she didn't want to have to be the one to tell him to go away all of the time. So Josie would be the one to go out there and be like, hey, Orlando, you can't just be showing up at her place all the time, that's totally inappropriate. Josie would go on to say that Orlando was weirdly possessive over Haley, even though they weren't even a couple. 
whole, it was obvious that he wanted a lot more from Haley than just this little fling. He wanted something serious and she just was not giving it to him, so he became obsessed with her. By September 15th, 2017, Haley had attended a party that Orlando had thrown at his house. When she got there, Orlando found out that the real reason that Haley didn't want a serious relationship with him was because she had gotten back together with Kevin. Obviously, this made him very upset that she would dare to choose Kevin over him, so of course, he confronted her about it at the party and they were yelling a lot and things got pretty heated between them. After the verbal altercation though, Orlando tried to smooth things out and he poured everybody shots and was hoping to sort of calm things back down again, but Orlando had already been pretty drunk at that point, so he started throwing up and pretty much had to leave the party. After the party, Kevin went back to Haley's to spend the night there. That next morning, September 16th, the two had been walking out of Haley's place when they walked past Haley's car, and Kevin noticed something odd about her car. When they looked closer, they noticed that all of Haley's tires had been slashed. So, she took a Snapchat video showing the damage and posted it to her story. Immediately, Kevin said that he knew that this was Orlando. Now, when they confronted Orlando about this entire thing, of course, he denied it, and he actually tried blaming the entire thing on Kevin for being the one that really slashed her tires. But Haley did get the police involved. She knew, obviously, that this wasn't Kevin. She knew that it was Orlando, so the police came over and took a look and they said that this caused over $600 in damage. So, even though they knew that Orlando was definitely the one who was responsible, Haley actually declined to press charges. Because of how much the damage had cost, this technically was considered a felony, and because of that, Orlando could be kicked out of nursing school and he could possibly be sent back to Nicaragua. So, being the empathetic and kind person that Haley is, she didn't want him to lose everything over this incident, so she just let it go. After this, of course, Haley stayed away from Orlando and and she avoided seeing or interacting with him very much, but as months passed, Haley slowly did let Orlando back into her life. Her family and Kevin alike all warned her against this and they told her to stay away from him, but she really valued the friendship that the two had between them. She thought that he was just a really good friend to her and she thought that the more time that passed, that things would just go back to normal, but that actually is not what ended up happening. Now, on the evening of March 7th, 2018, Haley had spent the evening at home with her two roommates. They played games together, they drank some wine, and by 1 a.m., they all said goodnight and then went into their separate ways into their own rooms. That next morning on March 8th, when Josie and Michelle both woke up, they noticed that Haley hadn't come out of her room, so they texted her to see if she was awake but they got no answer. However, this was not concerning to them at all at first because Haley loved to sleep in and they were like, who knows how late she could have slept in today. So they just thought that she was sleeping and that there was nothing out of the ordinary and that obviously she would be awake soon. But as more time passed and they continued texting Haley and no one could get a hold of her, they became more and more concerned. But again, like I said earlier, she liked to go out. She had a lot of friends and she was usually just out and doing her own thing. So her roommates sort of just went about their day on that Thursday, just thinking that they would see Haley later. That evening though, Josie had plans to read her poetry at a local cafe's poetry night and Haley had promised Josie that she would attend to watch her read. But when poetry night came and went once again and Haley didn't show up, her roommates really started to panic. They knew that if Haley promised to do something, if she told her friends that she would be somewhere, that she would be somewhere. And so her not showing up was really concerning. As this was going on, Orlando's sister also started to grow worried because she hadn't heard from him in a couple of days either. She asked the police to do a welfare check at his house. And when they did, they saw that Orlando's car was not there. 
so it looked to them as if he had just left and was maybe out for a while, so it seemed to them at this time that there was nothing to worry about. So as the Friday continued and Haley just was not responding to either Josie or Miss Sheila, they knew that this was very unlike her. She would never go this long with just ignoring everyone's calls and text messages. There was just no way. So they decided to check her location on the Find My iPhone app and it actually showed that she was at Orlando's house. When they saw this initially, it was almost a relief to them. They thought that they would go over to Orlando's house and just see that they had been sleeping all day and that maybe Haley just didn't tell anyone she was there because she was upset or embarrassed or wanted to hide the fact that she had hooked up with Orlando again. Because you can imagine, obviously, when your friends are telling you to stay away from this guy, and you just can't stay away from him and it seems that, you know, you're always going back to your ex or the person that you, you know, told that you didn't want a relationship with. Your friends might, you know, judge you for it. Your friends might give you crap for it. So, it makes sense that at this time they thought that, okay, Haley's just been there for a couple days. She just didn't want to tell us. So, we're going to find her there and she's you know, gonna be sleeping and it's gonna be no issue. But again, of course, they were concerned enough that they did go over to Orlando's house. Now, when they got to Orlando's house, they immediately saw that Orlando's car was missing and to them, this was the first big red flag. Then they started knocking on the doors to see if anybody was there, but nobody was answering, so this really concerned them. So acting on their concern and worry for Haley, both of the girls entered the house through a window. Josie boosted up Miss Sheila and then it climbed in through the window herself. Then, as they were walking through, Miss Sheila was just ahead of Josie, but quickly after entering the house and going into Orlando's room, Miss Sheila yelled to Josie to call 911 immediately. When Josie asked her what happened, that is when Josie saw what Miss Sheila just saw. They saw that Haley was laying face up in Orlando's bed and she was nude. At the time, Josie said that she was just sort of in this state of, I guess, shock. She said that she couldn't tell if something had happened to Haley. There was no sign of a struggle. There was no blood, but she just had a gut feeling. She just looked really pale and she wasn't moving. She was just laying there. Obviously, when you see your friends come in, you wake up or you say hi to them or something, but she was just laying there. So, of course, they did call 911 to report what they saw. When police had arrived, they saw that it looked as if Haley had been carefully placed in the bed. The blanket was pulled halfway up her body and then her arms were at the sides of her body. When looking closer at her body, she was found to have bruising all over her arms as well as her neck. Upon autopsy, it was found that she had been strangled to death in that room, but at this time, Orlando was nowhere to be found. So, now police had the job of figuring out exactly how Haley ended up at Orlando's house and then where Orlando went after that. Luckily, Orlando actually lived in a house that had security cameras on the outside, which did pick up his and Haley's movements. So, it showed that on the early morning hours of March 8th, Haley and Orlando had walked up to his home at around 3.14 a.m. and, of course, she seemed to go in willingly. Then, again, seven hours later after that, cameras picked him up going outside and then taking out the trash and then leaving in his car. Inside the house, police found a receipt that showed that he purchased z and melatonin from a local CVS that same morning. Shortly after this, cameras captured Orlando going back into his home. He then stayed inside for another seven hours. Then he came back outside and then you see him going into the basement of the home. Several hours after this, he is seen leaving the house once again, this time carrying luggage and driving away. Now, when they entered the home, they found several things that sort of put together a story of what could have happened that night. First, they found that Orlando had written what looked to them to be a suicide note that was written in Spanish. Translated, it reads, I'm really sorry about this. I never felt that I would be capable of doing this. 
father, I'll see you soon. Now, Orlando had passed away for a couple of years by that point, so it intended that Orlando had planned on taking his own life, according to this note. In the basement, they found that there had been four hooks nailed to the top of a doorway with a tie hanging from it. Then below the hooks, there looked to be spots of blood on the floor as well. So investigators believed that these were signs that Orlando had attempted to take his own life by hanging himself, but that he fell and hurt himself. Then once he didn't end up taking his own life, he decided to flee. As this was happening, Orlando's roommate had also been searching for Orlando. So he actually ended up calling Orlando's sister and that is when he found out that Orlando had boarded a flight and that he was headed back home to Nicaragua. Earlier that morning, he had texted his sister saying, I'm a disgrace to the family. I did something bad. So, police found surveillance video from JFK International Airport, which is around a three hours drive away from Bringenton University. On the surveillance video, it looks like Orlando has a bandage on his head, which is most likely from hitting his head after his failed suicide attempt. He hopped on a flight and he did make it to Nicaragua. Once he got there, his mother picked him up from the airport and then she drove Orlando to the small town that he had grown up in, in the small town of China Giga. After a few days being there, it was a pretty small town, so there wasn't really a lot of people, there wasn't really much access to medical care, so his mother drove Orlando about an hour and a half south to the city of Leon, where he could get medical attentions for wounds that did appear to be self-inflicted. As this was all going on, obviously, news outlets all over the state of New York and all over the country were reporting on Haley's murder and how this fugitive was now on the run and was thought to have left the country. So, it was only a few days after Orlando had arrived in Nicaragua that he was actually found and apprehended by the police. It was thought that someone probably recognized him at the hospital that he was at and then called police to report it and they came and arrested him. The day after he was found by police, they held a press conference where they told the world that they had found this missing fugitive. They put him in front of the world for everybody to see. He stood there with police with a big bandage on his forehead. So now police in the US were wondering what happens from here. Now, Orlando did actually have dual citizenship between the US and Nicaragua. Because of this, Nicaragua had no obligation to extradite him back to the US. Both countries had the right to hold him, so Nicaragua kept him. For the year and a half that followed, Boone County officials were basically under the impression that they would eventually be able to get Orlando back to the US to try him for the murder. They were going back and forth with Nicaragua and trying to figure out what the next steps were going to be. It was actually decided that Nicaragua would not be returning Orlando back to the US. Instead, he would be tried in Nicaragua. Of course, this really concerned Boone County officials. They were wondering how this was going to work and they were hoping that he would get the jail time that he deserved even if it wasn't in the US. In the US, he would have been charged with second degree murder. However, in Nicaragua, he was actually being charged with femicide. In general, femicide is defined by murdering a woman or a girl specifically because she is female. However, in Nicaragua, it defines it by going further as saying a crime against a woman from someone who was in a relationship with her. So, because Haley had a relationship with Orlando, his crime fit the bill for femicide. Then, after going back and forth with their government processes, an agreement was made where U.S. officials and U.S. witnesses would be allowed to testify at the Nicaraguan trial via teleconferencing. This took place back in 2019 before COVID happened, so this was before it was normal to hold such serious events over the internet. So, this trial would be held with a Nicaraguan attorney, Nicaraguan judge, no jury, 
and everything would be up to Nicaraguan law. So, Boone County officials had absolutely no control over how this trial was going to go. So, they did whatever they could to make sure that they put forth every bit of evidence that they could via testifying and facilitating testimony from other witnesses. So, the trial for Orlando started on October 1st, 2019. Haley's mother, Karen, she was able to testify via teleconferencing. She talked about how many times that she told her about Orlando's behavior of driving past the house, stalking her, harassing her, and how he went on to slash her tires. She talked about how everybody warned Haley to stay away from him, but she was a kind and forgiving soul, so she didn't want him to lose everything over the tire incident, like I said earlier. Earlier. But instead of returning this forgiveness, instead of being a kind and compassionate person back towards Haley, he literally took everything away from her, her friends, and her family. Karen went on to say that throughout her entire testimony, anytime she was able to get a glimpse of Orlando, he'd be sitting there smiling, looking really smug without a care in the world for what he did. The prosecution also called other witnesses, including Haley's friends and her boyfriend, Kevin, and all of them said much of the same thing. They also talked about the security video that they saw that showed a male and a female walking into the house, but only a male ever came out, and this male is assumed to be Orlando. They talked about his apparent suicide note, where he admitted that he had done something stupid that he didn't think he was capable of, and that he was sorry. Then, they brought forward the pathologist who performed the autopsy on Haley's body. The medical examiner stated that Haley died as a result of manual strangulation from pressure on her throat. He said that based on his findings, Haley was most likely asleep when she had been strangled. So, to me, that says that, you know, this wasn't in the heat of an argument. They weren't arguing and he lost control and strangled her. She was sound asleep and he looked at her just laying there asleep, and he made the decision to take her life. Then, after choking her to death while she was asleep, he just left, leaving and hopping on a flight back home like it was absolutely nothing. The prosecution argued that his motive for killing her was obviously jealousy. If he couldn't have her, then nobody could. So, the defense's job was made pretty difficult because of how much evidence there was. He clearly was the one who did kill her. So, rather than trying to argue that Orlando was innocent or that he wasn't the one who actually killed her, Instead, they said that Orlando's consumption of alcohol caused him to go into a temporary insanity, and because of that, he killed her. And because of his mental state, he is not legally responsible for his own actions. The defense called only one witness throughout the entire trial, and this witness was a clinical psychologist named Dr. Ronald Lopez Aguilar. He testified that Orlando told him that they had been heavily drinking that entire night. He said that after drinking, he doesn't remember anything that happened until he woke up the next morning and found her dead. So, what he's basically saying is that, you know, they were drinking a lot. He doesn't remember having any sort of argument. He doesn't even remember what he said to her or what they really did. Just that they started drinking and then nothing no memory of anything, and then he just woke up and she was dead in his bed next to him. But the prosecution argued that there's pretty much no way to prove that. It's not like there was glasses lying around or bottles lying around the apartment, at least that I know of, to show that the two drank or did any sort of drugs that night. Usually in a case like this, you'd see like a wine bottle sitting out with half drink, you know, wine glasses or fully drank wine glasses, but you'd could tell that they had just been drank and things like that, but there was no evidence of that. There was also nothing to show that he had any sort of mental disorder that could cause him to lose control over his actions. He had no sleep disorder, which could be argued that he was sleepwalking when this happened or something. There was absolutely nothing to prove what the defense was trying to say. After both sides made their closing arguments, the judge decided to give Haley's mother, Karen, the last word. Karen said, Quote, 
Haley was a beautiful, intelligent, and friendly girl. She was an aspiring nurse, and she had her whole life to look forward to. She was, and still is, my best friend, so thank you for listening to me and letting me speak on behalf of my daughter. So, like I said, with this trial, there was no jury. The decision was left solely up to the judge. So, she told the court that she would deliberate over a brief recess and that she would come back shortly with her decision. This did surprise people because they thought that it would take much longer to deliberate, but it only took an hour and a half of deliberation before the judge came back with her decision. She came back and said that Orlando disposed of Haley simply because he could not accept the fact that she had control over herself and her own body. She said that she does not stand for violence against women and that men just trying to exert themselves over women is just not going to fly, not in her courtroom. So, at the end of the trial, the judge did find Orlando guilty of femicide. Karen was given another chance to address Orlando at the end of the trial, and she said, quote, I hope that you get the highest amount of years behind bars because you deserve even more than that. Two weeks later, Orlando had to be sentenced. The judge said that Orlando made the decision to punish Haley for rejecting him. So now she was going to punish him by handing him down the maximum sentence sentence for the crime, which was 30 years. Obviously, Haley's family says that this does not bring Haley back, but they are very happy with the sentencing. Obviously, this entire trial being in another country is really nerve-wracking because you just don't know what to expect. You don't know if they're going to be more lenient. You don't know what kind of rules they have on sentencing. So, I can see how that was so nerve-wracking, but they said that they are so thankful to see the level of passion that the court had for violence against women. Karen said that at the end of the day, she is happy that she worked with that judge, and she's very happy to see that Orlando will be spending the maximum amount of time allowed behind bars. By February 4th of 2020, Orlando and his attorney stood in front of a judge once again, this time, they were requesting an appeal for his conviction as well as a new psychiatric evaluation. Now, he was continuing to speak with the excuse that he didn't remember what he did, but those around him just simply do not believe him. They said that especially with his nursing background and his medical knowledge, he knew exactly what he was doing when he began to strangle Haley. The request for a new evaluation was denied immediately, but Orlando's lawyer also argued that he was wrongly charged with femicide and that a 30-year sentence was far too harsh. They said that in the U.S., he likely would have been charged with second-degree murder and given a lighter sentence along with a better chance at parole. They said that because this crime took place in the U.S., that they are obligated to follow U.S. guidelines. Now, I am genuinely surprised that the Nicaraguan government was allowed to try him for a murder that didn't even take place in their country. I'm sure that the country has their own rules, but I haven't really seen any reason for why they chose not to extradite him back to the U.S. Like, I wonder why they wanted to take the time and the money to try someone for a crime that wasn't even committed in their country. However, I do wonder if Nicaraguan officials were so set on making an example out of a murderer against women that you know, they didn't want him to even get the chance to go back to the U.S. and get a cushier jail cell or a lighter sentence. I genuinely don't know. If you guys know more about this, please let me know in the comments because I am really curious. But either way, after reviewing his request for about three weeks, a panel of three judges completely denied Orlando's appeal. He will not be resentenced and he will not be sent back to the U.S. In an article that I read about Nicaraguan prisons, it states that they're pretty much known for overcrowding, lack of safe drinking water, and lack of medical services. They said that the cells are five meters by five meters and that sometimes there's as many as 20 people in one cell. The cells are dirty and there's insects everywhere. 
everywhere. They are given a bucket of water every day that they have to share with everybody else in their cell, and this water is used for cooking, cleaning, and drinking. They are given two small portions of food per day, mostly rice and beans, and if they want anything extra beyond that, they need to have loved ones bring it for them. So obviously overall as a whole, this is a problem. It's not okay that human beings are being exposed to such bad conditions, but part of me is happy with the irony of this entire thing. Orlando murdered a woman and he thought that fleeing to Nicaragua would get him out of trouble and completely put this entire thing behind him. Instead, it gave him a longer sentence, more public scrutiny, and worse prison conditions. And now, if he ever does get out of the Nicaraguan prison, and if he does ever go back to the U.S., they can just try him again for the same crime since it's not considered double jeopardy since the trial took place in another country. So really, instead of facing the consequences for his actions like he should have, he was left with the worst possible case scenario for himself because he wanted to run away. And part of me really enjoys that fact. I think that that's a big lesson to him and a lot of other people that, you know, if you're going to do something, if you make a really big mistake like this, if you take someone else's life, you just need to face the consequences. You m murdered somebody. You took their life away from them. There's no world that you deserve anything else other than going to prison and never enjoying a day in your life ever again. And that's my opinion. And I think the fact that he was trying to run away from it, the fact that he was trying to run away from consequences for what he did, and he was met with even worse, I'm happy with that. I'll just put it there. After the trial and the denial of his appeal, the Boone County District Attorney Steve Cornwell said, quote, America's legal system does not have a criminal charge like Nicaragua's femicide, but the protection it afforded Haley Anderson in this case was important. Orlando Tercero, in a cold-blooded manner, choked the life out of a young woman who we believed was probably sleeping and had been drinking. It doesn't get any more sick and depraved than that, preying on somebody who's helpless and completely overpowered them with no chance at all. So, I think he puts it pretty perfectly. He took her life away from her, there was absolutely nothing that she could have done to defend herself because she was sleeping. She was sleeping. And obviously, you know, I don't know to the extent that either of them drank, but we do know that Haley at least did drink. We know that she had that wine night with the girls. So we know that she had alcohol in her system. Maybe they continued drinking. Maybe they were both drunk. It doesn't really matter to me. What matters is that Haley's life was taken from her and that she was so helpless. It's not even that she was helpless in the sense that she couldn't like overpower him, but she was literally sleeping and that is just terrifying to think about. So obviously with all of this, Haley's family is just left with a big gaping hole in their lives that can never be filled because Haley was ripped away from them so senselessly and so suddenly. But they have said that they are thankful for how all of this went down and they're very happy to see that Orlando is behind bars and that his appeal was denied very quickly. And I agree. I'm so happy that Orlando got caught so quickly and I was so happy to see the level of passion that the court had in relation to violence against women. I'd wish to see more of that here in the U.S., but at the end of the day, Orlando is right where he belongs. His own actions led him to be in a prison system that seems a lot worse than the U.S. prison system and I know that there's a lot of problems with the U.S. prison system, but it does seem that at least they have livable conditions in most prisons. I can't speak for all of them, but a lot of them do, whereas Nicaraguan prisons seem to be pretty unlivable and pretty terrible. So, he put himself there. His own actions led him there. He genuinely didn't have to be there, but he went there on his own accord. So, I don't feel bad for him at all. But either way, that is all I have for today's video and now I want to hear your guys' thoughts. Do you think that Orlando should have been brought back to the U.S. and faced trial here since his crime did happen on U.S. soil? Are you glad that he's stuck in Nicaragua or do you think that it's not fair that he's there? 
Let me know this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put up new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Don't forget to head to ritual.com rs20 and use code rs20 at checkout for 20% off of your first month. Don't forget to go ahead and follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to send those suggestions over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!